Carl, if you would, uh, just jump that uh, screen up there. And uh, homecoming is next Sunday. We're going to have our full, first full Sunday of full Sunday school. It's 10 o'clock, and uh, there will be, we'll try to do our best to have Sunday school for all ages. We're a small church, so that we may combine some classes, or we may just be one person sitting in a class, or two, or three, but we're going to get started back and get back to the way we were before the, the plague hit. But next Sunday is Homecoming Sunday, and I'm excited about it. I don't know if we will have uh, former home members come and visit with us. We may have people come out here to place flowers on a loved one's grave in the cemetery, come in to visit with us. Uh, for, for many, many years, I, I went with Terry's family out to a, a place outside of uh, Town Creek uh, called Black Ground Cemetery, and many of her family members are buried there. I used to go there on a Sunday on Mother's Day, and there would be many, many people there. It was Decoration Day, something we do here in the South, is we have homecoming and decorations, sometimes the same, sometimes different. But there would be many, 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 many people in the cemetery, many people in the church that day. Little church that was that uh, that church uh, wanted to meet with Terry and I many years ago, with the possibility of calling me there to be their pastor. And uh, we were so glad they didn't call us, and, and uh, we got away from there. But I preached for them, met with their. Uh, committee asked answered lots of questions and it uh, just wasn't wasn't God's will for us to be there and uh, what a you know I thought well, to be the pastor of the church that actually is where where our family meets for decoration but but uh, all I ask, as they say very few people go there anymore very few people go there uh, just a few uh, even Terry's family, there, many of them are gone. Most of them are gone. And uh, that will be their final resting place, I, I know, But uh, for many of them. But uh, people do, uh, uh, whatever homecoming is or decoration, it is tremendously different than it once was. Let's go on to the next slide there. We're going to uh, have two special guests next Sunday. Brother Phil Waldrop is going to be with us. And Miss uh, Linda Sue Brown is going to sing for us. We're just going to give, we're going to probably, I've told Danny, we're just going to start with an opening song, have a word of prayer, and just let, let these two have it. And uh, I, I wish we could get Charles Billy, but I, I know, I guess I enjoy Miss Linda Sue about as much. But uh, speaking of that, let's, let's look, pray for these two people as they minister to us and lead us in worship next Sunday. Let's go on the card to the next slide. Uh, the Gridiron Men's Conference that is sponsored by Phil Walter Ministries will be on the, the uh, 18th and 19th of June. It is the Friday and Saturday before Father's Day. And uh, they're having it at the Von Ross Civic Center, the Probst Arena. And it starts, here's the, uh, if you need this, you probably can't read this, but I put this up here so I can read it. But it's going to start Friday night. It is at the Von Ross Civic Center at 6 p.m. that night. And it'll be over at 10 that night. And next morning starts at uh, 8.30 and Journey at around 12.30. Brother Phil always brings the final message of the conference. So, uh, we're not going as a church. Just, uh, if I, I hope to be able to go and want to try to go. And it's going to drive over there and back Friday night, over there and back Saturday. It's $109 to pay to help them for their guest fees and to pay their expenses for their guests and to rent and furnish the uh, venue. It's a very expensive thing, no doubt. It seems like $109 seems to be very inexpensive to be able to go. But if you can go, if you're a man, I, uh, I always see several women around. But it's it's a men's conference. And so uh, if you ever hear of a, uh, we used to hear quite often of women's conferences and ladies' conferences. If you hear of one that you'd like to support or promote, please let me know. I'm, I'm not in that circle of news myself. But I, I hope to go. Uh, Rick Burgess is going to be speaking. Ike Ryder, and uh, there's going to be a Jonathan Evans. I think he might be Tony Evans' son. So uh, there are, of course, uh, Charles Billings is going to be leading our music and worship. It's always a, a good time. If you can get over there and back on your own, 
and I encourage you to put that on your calendar, put that on your schedule, and participate. Uh, let's let's go on then. I'm going to be talking with you today about church at the pool. Church at the pool. In the Gospel of John, the Gospel writer John does not use the word church in any of his words in the fourth gospel. He doesn't talk about Jesus founding the church, starting the church. He doesn't make any reference to the church, and yet the church is on every page. Because he saw the church as what he joined when he left his fishing business there on the shores of Capernaum at the Sea of Galilee. When the, the body of Christ, that Jesus is the body of Christ. And we're, when we're baptized, we're not baptized into an organization. We're baptized, Paul says in Romans chapter 6, into Christ. And there's a great difference between being baptized into water and being baptized into Christ. Yes, baptism is essential to your salvation. But the Bible says there's only one baptism. And that baptism is baptism into Christ. It's sometimes described in the New Testament as uh, baptized in the Spirit. And it's not talking, and that's to, to distinguish apart from water baptism. Water baptism is a picture of real baptism. It is an image, a figure, a, 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 a representation that we are immersed into Christ himself. Even Peter says, well, we, you know, it's, we're not talking about just the cleansing of filth or dirt from the body. He says, we're talking about being changed. In Paul's letter to Titus, he wrote in the third chapter, the fifth verse, he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. He's talking about baptism, the Lord's Supper, church attendance, and so forth. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration. To be regenerated is to rebirth, to be born again. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Ghost. And so that's the real kind of washing. That's the real kind of immersion. That's the, the real kind of baptism. In John's Gospel, he talks, we see him that wherever Jesus went, it was a worship opportunity. Wherever Jesus was, it was, it was God showing up and showing out. It isn't. He didn't have to be in the synagogue or at the temple. It didn't have to be a religious venue. It could be any place at any time. And all of heaven was focused upon him. All of earth surrounded him. He was the center of the universe. And that is, I believe, the best understanding to have of what it means to go to church or have church or be the church. Let's go on, Carter. I'm going to show you this because that's not the pool I want to talk to you about at all, but it's this one. Now, you can see a little bit, there are some surrounding areas here, that this is almost in the center of the present-day city of Jerusalem. This, this hole in the ground. <laughs> you see, over the years, uh, layers of earth just build up over time. And so when they dug down, they found here what they knew to be, or what they discovered to be, the pool of Bethesda that is mentioned in the Gospel of John chapter 5. It is mentioned as a, a pool or a washing or a cleansing area that had five porches. Jerusalem is a mixture of ancient and modern architectures. And it's, you, can, you can feel like you're back and take one step and you're like you're in the time of Jesus. And then take another step and you're at a modern six-star, five-star motel. And a, a restaurant. But right in the city of this, right in the middle of this city of Jerusalem, they, they've preserved this and kept this. It, it is a place where thousands and thousands of people travel to every year to see this place in Jerusalem. And so right in the middle of town is this 
ruin. This ruin. And there are lots of old things in the land of Israel that haven't been blown up by Hamas. But this archaeological site has not been preserved because it is the pool of Bethesda. Do you know why they guard this and have preserved it and kept it and maintain it in the exact they're not they don't try to they're not trying to improve it or restore it. They, they want to keep it exactly the way it is. Do you know why? It's not because it's a tremendous ancient site. It's because Jesus healed a man in this place. That's the only reason that it matters at all to anybody. Go to the next slide there, Carter. Now this is a video. It doesn't have any audio. Click on that screen right there, Carter. Bring the light, the house lights down a little bit so that it shows up a little better. It has a sign there that says this is for the medicinal baths. There at John chapter 5. And this is, I shot this when Terry and I were there in 2008. The pool of Bethesda. You can see the five porches there. There are other little baptismal fonts. There are places that, little, just little stone boxes that held water for washing and cleansing yourself. And there's our group and our guide. Here's Miss Bain, our group. I can't remember all of those people's names anymore. There's Brother Scotty Hogan, former pastor at Westmead. Brother Donnell Brown, former director of missions. This was a place where the Gospel of John chapter 5 tells us that a great, tremendous crowd of sick, and blind, lame people would go every day because there was a story about an angel that would come there from time to time and use his wings to stir up the water. And whoever could get into that stirred up water first would be healed. Okay, make that uh, slide advance there, Carter. Let's get to the scripture. In John's Gospel, chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish religious holidays. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was the pool of Bethesda. It had five, five covered platforms or porches surrounding it. Crowds, it says in this translation. Crowds. Now, these were people who couldn't walk. Some of them couldn't see. They were blind. And so... Every day, someone who loved them or cared for them, a member of their family or one of their friends, helped these people. Sometimes those, those who could crawled there or crept there or looked there and to get here. Crowds came. And so every day it was a ritual of, if there was someone in your family or someone you care about, a brother perhaps or a sister who was plagued by some physical infirmity, you would bring them to this place and and maybe leave them a little bit of something to drink. Or maybe they could drink the water from the pool. I don't know if it was possible. Or leave them a, a scrap or a crumb of bread to eat for lunch. And then later on, you would come by and pick them up on your way home from work. Crowds of sick folk, laying blind or with paralyzed limbs, lay on the platforms waiting for a certain movement of the water. For an angel of the Lord came from time to time and disturbed the water. And the first person to step down into the water afterwards was healed. Now I want you to notice that there's a little footnote marker right here. 
And it pertains to all of this that is in the parentheses. Footnote. So here's the setting. All of these sick people, all these hurting people gathering there every day with the hope that something might happen that probably some of them had never actually seen before and that many wondered if it actually ever really happened. But there were some there who perhaps had seen it, the angel of the Lord coming down, stirring the waters, and someone able to jump in quickly enough after the waters began to stir, and that person being healed, and they were all waiting. They did not have their hopes in their family, or their hopes in a doctor or physician, and even Luke, the physician, writes, he doesn't make any comment about, boy, I wish I'd been there. I, maybe I could have done them some good. But he realizes that this is a crowds of people every day. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, a drawing, a sketch, of what it might look like when this angel came down to the waters and used their wings to stir the waters. Now, the reason there is a footnote there is if you read the footnote, the notes, notations, there are about 5,000 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament that we have access to today. The footnote says that the words that are in the parentheses are not in the oldest, are the best preserved manuscripts that we have found to date. In other words, all that information about the angel of the Lord coming down and stirring the water and people jumping in the water after. There's, what, it, what the footnote says is there's a really strong possibility that this was never in the original writing of the Gospel of John. This might have been inserted because in verse 7, however, there is a, a, a verse that is not in question at all that seems to imply that that story was a valid story. But I think that this shows perhaps, I want you to think of the, the tumult, the, the chaos, the heartache and as these people came and arrived Can you imagine that? It's, that that ruin exists today as a memorial to this story and the possibility that this was something that perhaps God did every once in a while. Let's go on to the next slide, Carter. One of the men lying there had been sick for 30 years. Eight years. One of the men there had been sick for 30. Now Jesus was around 30 years of age at this time. Every year of his life, even when he was eight days old, every year of his life, Joseph and Mary would take Jesus to Jerusalem for the Jewish holidays. This was a Jewish holiday. Do you think that this is the first time that Jesus ever visited the pool of Bethesda? Do you think he'd never heard of it? Do you think in all of his 30 years of going to Jerusalem and running like a wild Indian all over town, and his mom and daddy didn't even know where he was, do you think he never saw this sad place in his life? I don't believe it. I believe he saw it many times. I believe that he would go there and just stare at it, and he would hear his father say, not, not now, and it's not time. Let me ask you a question. It's, a, it's one of those lifelong pondering questions. But I want you to think about this. I want you to listen to this question. Is there any problem or need or difficulty in your life? Has there ever been a problem 
or a tragedy or a crisis or a difficulty in your life that you would be willing to wait 38 years for God to fix. Boy, that, no. <laughs> you know when I ask God for anything, do you know when I want it? Right now. I want it right now. God give me patience and give it to me right now. 38 years. Well, maybe God just didn't know about this guy. Maybe he'd never seen him before. Maybe God is just heartless and cruel and he was just ignoring him. Maybe Jesus didn't know that this place existed. I don't believe any of those things. Do you think there might be some things in your life that hurt or that are not right? Things that won't work or things that need fixing? Do you think that God is standing up on the edge of heaven just waiting any moment to fix that or address it? Or do you think it might possibly make, take 38 years for him to attend to that? All I'm really saying, folks, is, is that you and I don't know what's in the heart and mind of God. We can't control Him. And fixing my life is not the most important thing on the God of the universe's heart and mind. Yes, He loves me and He loves you and He cares for you. And those things matter to Him. But to think that that's the reason He exists or that it's foremost on his mind is arrogant. It's arrogant of me to think that God only exists to wait on me and serve me and to help me and to fix me. 38 years when Jesus saw him and knew how long he had been ill. I wonder how he knew. He knows. He knew how long he'd been ill. He asked him, would you like to be well? <laughs> what a question, huh? Would you like to be healed? Would you like to be healed? Do you need to ask that question? Jesus has questions for me and for you that he knows the answer to. He has questions to ask that we need to answer just simply because he's asked us and it is a part of our relationship, it's a part of us walking through whatever it is and wherever we're at in our lives would you like to be well? well, yes let's go on to the next slide I can't, the sick man said, I can't be well, can't be healed, for I have no one to help me into the pool at the movement of the water. While I'm trying to get there, someone else always gets in ahead of me. You see, this verse 7 seems to confirm everything that is mentioned, or at least implied in the parentheses. This verse is in every manuscript we have, verse 7. So... If someone inserted that, maybe it was under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but even if it wasn't there, we'd say, okay, well, this is about something that happens. And this man is talking as if this is something that has happened to me. I know that I can't be healed because the waters have stirred in the past and others got in ahead of me. Then why go? Hope is a, is a difficult thing. If you've ever watched or read the story of the Shawshank Redemption, Shawshank Re Redemption is really just a short story, kind of a novel, written by Stephen King. But the movie is, uh, is an amazing work of art. It's very crude and, and uh, has harsh language in it. But if you've never watched the Shawshank Redemption, I, I'd say it's probably worth a watch. But it's about some men who are in prison 
and they've been in prison for many, many years. And one of them is Andy Dufresne. And he still, after many, many, many years in prison, has hope of being free. His friend, Red, believes that hope is a terrible thing, to, to have hope, to, to look to the future with great hope or anticipation is terrible because hope is all false and hope is a bad thing. Well, one thing that Red learns before this movie is over, this story is over, is that hope is a good thing. Perhaps, Andy says, the best of things to hope. This man knew that he probably put his mat or his pallet as close to the edge of the water as he possibly could, and yet he was so physically incapacitated that he knew if the waters began to stir, that still someone would beat him into the water. He said it's happened before. And yet he came every day. Someone brought him every single day. Jesus told him, stand up, roll up your sleeping mat, and go home. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his mat and began walking. Let's look at the next slide. Think about this conversation. Has anybody ever talked to you while you were flat on your back? I'm not just talking about figuratively either, I mean literally. Has anyone ever talked to you when you were just flat on your back, when, when it looked like you had no hope? I'm here in the healing place and there's just no chance at all. He doesn't know who this man is, we'll see that, and you could see that in the text. He doesn't know who that is. He doesn't know who's talking to him. He's even surprised that anybody is talking to him. And he comes up and he starts by saying, would you like to be well? Let's go on to the next slide, Carter. I don't really know anything about the angel who came down and stirred the waters. But I see many Christians throughout my Christian ministry of, of over 50 years who really what they're looking for, what they're searching for, what they're hoping for is a stirring. Not just a stirring of the waters, not just a movement of the angel's wings, but they're looking for some kind of stirring from God. The stirring is a, an emotional feeling. It is a, a feeling of exaltation. It, it is a, an emotional burst of energy and life and light. Uh, it, something that we, we, we long to be stirred by prayers and music. We learn, long to be stu, stirred by a message or by a, a meeting. We're looking for it. You know why? Because someone told us about a stirring that happened years ago. Or maybe we even remember times of great stirrings where our hearts were, were lifted up and were, we felt a surge of strength and power and it was joyous and, and it was a feeling of it that we didn't know whether to laugh and sometimes it made us cry. But it was, it was something that we remember and we long every day for it to return because it touches us, it moves us, it shapes us. It is something that is, it thrills us. And we hunger for it, we love, we long for it. I was thinking just last week, I found an old bulletin in among mother's things, it was the bulletin the Sunday before she, Terry and I were married. It was our, the bulletin in our church home, in Flint Baptist Church, and it had a little insert inside the bulletin. It invited everybody in our church to our wedding that Friday night. And I saw some names that I recognized in that bulletin, and I, I re remembered, I knew that Betty Law had 
type to that bulletin and run it off on the mimeograph machine. And every time I think of the place where I met Jesus, I, I think of services that we had and people that got saved and glory that fell down. And how many times the angel of the Lord or the Lord himself stirred our meetings and lifted our hearts. And every place that I've ever served and every place that I've ever traveled, more than anything else, I've tried to recreate that atmosphere. And I, I learned sometimes in some places how to do it. I remember the very first time I went over to Point Mallard and saw a wave pool. That was like witchcraft. Get there in a big swimming pool and watch the waves go up and down. Man-made waves. Man-made stirrings. And I have found out something that this man is about to find out. All of these people had their hope in the possible chance that this great stirring of the waters might take place and it might do what it could do for one individual. But something was different. Something had changed. This was a different kind of circumstance and as Jesus always did, he's stepping into this and saying, no, no. I'm going to pay a clip for you, just a video clip, where Jesus says, no, no, no. Let's go to the next slide there, Carter. You see, this man's telling Jesus about the stirring. We're waiting to be stirred. We're waiting for this miraculous, supernatural thing to happen. Jesus is looking back and he turns around and says, no, no. It's time for something better. Something better. It's hard to convince us that it's better. Let's go to the next slide there, Carter. It's the greatest thing. I've heard many great sermons preached on this. Well, this is the title. The man says, I have no one. You see, this man was not only placing all of his hopes and dreams for life upon a supposed stirring of the waters by the angel of the Lord. He didn't even have someone that he could count on to help him. You may or may not be looking for or anticipating or praying for or wishing for a stirring from God. But when you don't see that, or when that doesn't manifest itself, when it doesn't appear that God is going to stir a church, you know what you'll start doing? You'll start looking around for people who can help you. People you can count on. People who will give you what you need. People who will be exactly what you need in this circumstance, in this situation. You know what? This man was in a perfect situation because he had no one. There are people who look to the preacher, to the pastor, to be the person to help them connect with God, to help them find the stirring that they need, the healing, the health, the strength, the power, the hope that they need. Or they look to a deacon or to a mentor, to a spiritual leader. If you have your hope and your trust, if you're, if you're, you know, what holes would God poke in you to say, no, you can't count on this person to be your hope. You know, as a Christian, you and I are always going to come in where we will find great good in being assisted by others. But your journey is to get to a place where all you need is Christ. All you need is Jesus. 
You know what Paul said in Philippians 4.19? He says, For my God shall supply your every need according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I remember James Robinson used to start off his crusade meetings by having John McKay lead the choir in the congregation at the football stadium. And Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All that I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All that I need. You know, if you need somebody, if they don't meet that need, they stand between you and God. Oh, I would do what God wants me to do. I would, I would be the person God wants me to be. But that person right there is not doing their part of getting me there. That person's not helping me. That person's not assisting me like they're supposed to. That person is not leading me and guiding me. That person doesn't have me by the hand to get me where I need to be. Therefore, there's something going on that is a barrier between me and God and me and the life that God wants me to have. If you need somebody besides Christ, because people you need are going to fail you. They're going to let you down. And as a matter of fact, it is not ever people that you need. Click on the next slide there, Carter. Everything changes now. Bring down all the lights again, Carter. Get these out of the choir, too. And click on that. Shalom. Me. Yes. Shalom. I have a question for you. For me. I don't have many answers, but I'm listening. Do you want to be healed? Who are you? We'll get to that later. But my question remains. Will you take me to the water? <laughs> Look, I'm having a really bad day. You've been having a bad day for a long time. So? Sir, I have no one to help me into the water when it's stirred up. And when I do get close, the others step down in front of me. And so... Look at me. Look at me. That's not what I asked. I'm not asking you about who's helping you or who's not helping or who's getting in your way. I'm asking about you. <laughs> I've tried. For a long time, I know. And you don't want false hope again, I understand. But this pool, it has nothing for you. It means nothing. And you know it. But you're still here. Why? I don't know. You don't need this pool. You only need me. So, do you want to be healed? So let's go. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk.
I'm free to walk, like he said. Don't forget your bed. Why does this matter? Because you're not coming back here. That life is over. Everything changes now. Reach a place in my life where I could say that part of my life is over. Everything changes now. I don't know what the pool is that you've been coming to every day. But Jesus says, that pool has nothing for you, and you know it. And then he says the most audacious thing that anyone could ever say. He says, all you need is me. All you need is me. He says, I'm, I'm not here talking about who, who helped you, who didn't help you, who stands in your way. He said, I'm talking about you. When I extend an invitation, I'm not inviting you. Our invitation, I believe, is God's invitation to you. It is not an invitation to walk down an aisle. It is not an invitation to take me by the hand. It is not an invitation to me. It is not an invitation to kneel at our altar. You can have all of those things if you want them. But that's not what our invitation is inviting you to. It's not inviting you to join the church. It is not inviting you to be baptized. It is not to help you in your search for a stirring. It's always come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. That's all it ever is or ever was. That's all our invitation is. It's come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. All we need is Him. All we need is Him. And we know that everything changes. Everything changes. Lord Jesus, I pray today that if there is someone here today, they've been waiting and searching and seeking. and They've had an experience or seen an experience in the past and They'd like to recreate it. They'd like to be a part of it now. They're waiting for something that happened before to happen again. Our Lord, they're, they're wishing for something that would happen. And none of that really has anything at all to do with you and them. Whatever that person today is seeking or looking for or wishing for or longing for, I pray that they would abandon it and just simply turn their eyes upon you and realize that you are all they need. There's nothing for them in the pool. There's nothing that the pool has to offer. Nothing that a stirring can give them more than a momentary elation when they might instead have a lifetime of running, walking and running and leaping because of you. I pray that you'd work in our midst today. You would work in our life. You. You. Because we do have someone. We do have someone. We have you. And we need not depend for help or assistance or ministry from anyone else. You. We pray it in your name. Amen. Brother Danny, what's our hymn of invitation today?